Did you know? School Sport Victoria offers 650,000 sporting opportunities in 31 different sports. At 10,700 events across the state every single year. That's a lot of kids playing sport. And for over 25 years, the Victorian School Sports Awards have recognised more than 1,500 students, teachers and volunteers for excellence and outstanding contribution to school sport. Now that's a champion effort. Good afternoon and welcome the SSV family, teachers, students, parents and everyone out there tuning in to today's Ask SSV show. We're live with Matt Harnipal, OAM, the, one of the greatest Australian Paralympic swimmers. Welcome on a very Sunday, sunny Friday afternoon. We're very, very glad we can have you with us. Welcome, Matthew. Welcome uh, and th thanks to, for having me. Um, it's a great opportunity to really to have a chat to some parents, some students, um, and to the whole school sport family. It's, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, we're absolutely thrilled to have you on board and uh, we're really looking forward to the next next hour or so to, to work out a little bit about a little bit more about you and what you can pass on to the many student athletes out there that um, uh, will be able to take away something from this session. So I'd like to introduce Matt Hartnell to you, our SSV family, if you don't know enough about him already. But as you know, one of our champion Australian Paralympic swimmers. He's represented Australia at multiple, multiple huge events. The 2012 Summer Paralympics in London, the 2013 IPC Swimming World Championships, the 2014 Panpac Swimming Championships, and the 2016 Rio Summer Paralympics as well. And most recently at the 2018 Commonwealth Games. At his debut Paralympic Games, he achieved his dream of gold and he burst onto the same as a member of the men's 4x100 freestyle relay team and got gold straight away. He burst onto the scene, like I said. Following that, he was awarded the Order of Australia medal. Matt was born with a right hemiplegic cerebral palsy uh, or following a prenatal stroke at 20 weeks, but he learned to swim as part of his rehabilitation. It's an incredible story. However, it was only in 2005, not even that long ago, that he could start to take the sport seriously, having finally found someone who knew how to coach athletes with a disability. After that, it was all systems go and the rest, as they say, is history. Post London, Matthew contested at the 2013 International Paralympic Committee Swimming World Championships in Montreal, Canada, and that's where he won his first major individual medal, and that's bronze in the 100 metres freestyle category. Since then, Matt's journey has taken him to become one of Australia's premier Paralympians. Uh, he's been he's trained away from his home base in Melbourne across the country. And as I mentioned, he's, he went on to compete at the 2016 Rio Olympic Games. As with many athletes, and as I'm sure many of our SSV athletes can relate to, Matt's faced his fair share of setbacks and challenges. And that's including juggling VCE over a fuse as well. We'll definitely touch on that and how you managed to do that, Matt. And a significant shoulder injury. Um, and injury is a huge part of sport, as we all know, and, and how you can overcome that. We at SSV were incredibly fortunate to call Matt Harnipal as one of our own and, and an SSV ambassador. In fact, before the Rio Olympics, uh, Harnipal, I'm pretty sure, Matt, you said you hope to inspire others and show everyone that people with a disability can achieve things. Matt, you're an incredible story. You're also an incredible athlete. And uh, again, welcome to the show. Jeez, Peter, that's an amazing um, introduction to go through and hear your story, you know, my own personal story back, not just from the, but from the sporting perspective, but also looking at what is out there in, you know, the other part of my life as well in terms of the charities I work with and also the, you know, working with students every day is something I, I, I take a lot of interest in and going out to schools and, and primary schools in particular and, and to really uh, work with them and understand, um, you know, the values of res resilience and and hard work that can come with sport, but also can be well transferred to the classroom as well. Absolutely, Matt, and we, we look forward to taking away many uh, lessons, valuable lessons today. Um, I believe we're about to have a short video of some of Matt's achievements.
Oh, I do apologise. I do apologise. I've got that one wrong. Um, Matt, look, I mentioned some of the some of career highlights that um, yeah, experienced you know close to a decade now ago. Um, it's been some time. Which which of those, whether it's Rio or or your time at IPC, which one of those um, moments was perhaps the most latest for you? I think also backing up. So backing up a bit even a bit further. So I, I broke onto the Australian swim team uh, for the first time in in 2010 as a junior swim team member um, at the age of 16. Uh, I, would, I would go to the the Berlin International Championships, uh, and while that was not a an Olympic or Paralympic team, that was the first step for me to understand what international sport was all about and what is required for elite athletes at that level. So for me, going to overseas for the first time uh, and, and being with other like-minded staff and, and coaches and swimmers was something of a great experience for me. Um, I'd go to the Berlin International Championships a number of times after London as well as a senior team member. Um, but talking about London in particular, um, it still is, is, is regarded as probably one of the most successful uh, Paralympic Games ever. Um, the way that the Paralympic, um, I guess, fraternity was seen in the UK was far and beyond what was seen in Beijing and certainly for Athens prior to that. And so it was an incredibly exciting opportunity to, to go to, to, to the Paralympics in 2012 and to do so well. Um, you know, we can touch on, you know, uh, Montreal in 2013 later on and, 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 and you know, and, and Rio as well. But I think London for me stands, still stands out as probably the, the peak of my career and, 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 and it was at the very beginning. Um, I learned a lot of things through my career, but the one thing I learned very early on, uh, right back in Berlin, was how, how high performance works and how to balance uh, both your school and your um, elite athlete prospects. Yeah, fantastic. And look, just touching on that 2012 um, experience at Rio, you, you obviously burst onto the scene there with the gold in the 4 by uh, relay, in the freestyle relay. Um, you know, what was it like to create friendships with those with those people and um, uh, how, how have you carried on relationships with those athletes moving on? Yeah, and I think, you know, the team in 2012, we were a very close-knit team. In fact, there were some seniors that had been on the team since Athens, even before Athens. There were some brand-new athletes, including myself, and it was probably the, the most exciting team to be part of. Um, we were – that team, the swim team, uh, part of the Paralympic team, was the most successful team we ever had uh, up until that point. Swimmers like Jackie Freeney, eight gold medals in one Paralympic Games – um, Matt Cowdery going to his last Paralympic Games as well. Uh, he would go later on to go and retire after the para, uh, the para Pan Packs in LA in 2014. There is um, that there was great friendships built and uh, still remain from that team. Yeah, fantastic. How old were you when you competed at that event, Matt? Uh, so, so London, I would have been 17, uh, and so qualified at 17, and then uh, when I was on the team, I was 18. So I'll still, yeah, wow. that's now, um, yeah, eight, eight and a half years ago now. It's amazing. It's amazing. Look, I touched, I touched earlier before on the fact that you started back in 2005 and um, that you had a bit of a journey before, of course, of course you had a journey heading into Rio, uh, sorry, London at 2012. Where did it all start for you? What, what kick-started your love and your interest in swimming? Yeah, so I started year four, um, what was then the Victorian Primary School Sports Association. It now is, uh, you know, it's the School Sports Victoria now. Um, I'm old enough to remember when the two organisations were separate. And um, it, one of the things that um, really stood out to me as well in my early part of the career was school sports about making friends and, and being able to enjoy that environment with people that are the same age and also not for just disability, but also people able-bodied as well. But what kicked it off for me was that swimming then and still remains a, a physical therapy for me. Um, as I'll grow older, I'll continue to swim. I still swim today. And, um, you know, it's an important life um, skill to have. Absolutely. Absolutely. Look, we want to welcome our first guest into the SSV Live, the Ask SSV Show, to have a chat to Matt Hartnell here. Welcome to Xavier 
Aguire, if I've got that correct, and Simon the yep. Apostle in Roadville. Welcome, Xavier. Hi. Fantastic to have you on the show, and I believe we've got a question for Matt. Yeah. So, Matt, um, in the night before swimming, before a big competition, mm -hmm. how do you deal with nerves to have a good night's rest? I think, I think for me, I think with nerves, it's uh, um, something that I've learned to sort of manage over a long period of time. Nerves is something that has come up at particular events. In some events, I might be not nervous at all. I might go to the state championships and it feels like I'm going to training. But I'll go to bigger events and particularly important events where they, you know, a, a world record might be on the line, a gold medal might be on the line, um, and those become a little bit more nervous. But then I think about what's important as part of the process of competition. And it's about looking at the process of your race, looking at what skills you need to do. So making sure your dive is, is straight into the water, making sure the turn is correct, my technique in the water is correct. If all those things come together, I believe that you'll have a very good race and you'll able to be able to focus on that race in a very important way. And I think that also confirms to you that there's no reason to be nervous because if you have practiced your skills, if you've been practicing your technique, I think that you'll be able to be confident that you've done everything you can to be, do the best you can. Okay. Thanks. So, Matt, you're saying preparation is probably the biggest thing, yeah. one, of, one of your biggest key there. And I, I think, um, I don't know what sport you do, Xavier, but um, what sport do you do? Do you mind me asking? Swimming. Swimming. You do my sport. Yeah. So, that's... That, that's um, that's them. Um, so for you in, in the sport of swimming, it's about getting the skills right. It's about practicing those things yeah. in, in training um, with your coach so you can rock up to your race feeling confident and you don't need to really feel nervous. Nervous. You'll be able to feel confident in what you're able to do. So I feel for me that's exactly a fantastic thing and I really would like to thank you for, for coming on the show today. Okay. Thanks, Xavier. Appreciate your time today, and we wish you all the best. Uh, you know, in the, in the next six months in your training. Yep. Thanks. Bye. Uh, it's great to be able to connect with some of the some, some of the SSP family. Oh, it's like fantastic. Um, and uh, look, really interesting. You know, even <laughs> it applies to so many areas of your life. Um, and some of the advice you're, you're giving out there, Matt, with preparation. So you know, really informative to all of you who are listening at the moment. Um, look, Matt, we wanted to move on to uh, some other, some perhaps deeper questions. Yeah, of course. I was always going to dig deeper. Um, <clears throat> now, what advice would you give, well, let's put ourselves in Xavier's shoes, what advice would you give to someone of his age or as a 12-year-old, knowing what you know now? Hmm. This is a difficult one because um, I have a lot of opportunities to, to go and spend time with you know, primary school students quite regularly. And that question comes up quite frequently is to have, you know, looking at um, what would you tell your younger self? And so what I have really looked at is, is really, it, it comes back to the same thing we we're doing is to make sure that I prepare, to make sure that you are, um, you know, confident in your skills, that all of those, um, you know, your training is up to scratch, um, you know, uh, good performance, equal, uh, good preparation equals good performance. So that's something I would really tell my younger self, but also I'd tell my younger self as well, balance is key. Sport is one thing, school is another as well, and those two things together, particularly at the ages of 12 and 13, is really important to have balance in your lifestyle and not to make one an important one over the other. Fascinating, fascinating insights, Matt. Um, look, I'm going to turn to one of our comments from YouTube, um, and I believe that our comments and our live comment section on YouTube is currently uh, not working the way it usually does, so I do apologise to those who have reached out. Um, we are experiencing some technical difficulties there, but I have got a comment, a uh, question from Cameron Marshall, who's from the Ashwood School. So thanks, Cameron, for your input for today's show, and his, his question to Matt is, how many Paralympics have you been to? 
So uh, as you, we, we went through in the, in, in the introduction, uh, the London 2012 Paralympic Games, uh, which was my first senior team, uh, and then went to the Rio Paralympic Games in 2016. Um, in terms of other major championships, the Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast as a home games um, was probably, uh, as a major championship, it's probably the most, um, my favourite of the lot, I would say. Is that largely attributed to the fact it was on home soil? Home soil, being allowed to go to, the, to my opening ceremony for the first time. So in, in London and Rio, uh, being swimming has been the first day of competition. Um, we didn't get an opportunity to go to the opening ceremony, but being an Australian um, uh, hosted competition, um, the Australian team said, no, nope, you make your own personal choices. You feel that it's right to go for your own competition. And because I wasn't in Wayne, I wasn't in uh, racing until about day four or day five, it made sense to go to the opening ceremony and to hear the Australian roar in, in you know, uh, on the Gold Coast was just an amazing experience. And I will never forget that moment. Thanks, Pat. Incredible insights. Incredible, incredible insights. Thank you. Um, I've got one other question for you before we go to another guest today. Um, how did you cope with the pressure? Um, obviously, you, know, you burst onto the scene in 2012. You then went through some full world championships, then headed to Rio mm. in 2016. And as you've just mentioned, the Com Games here in Australia. As, as, as time goes on, mm. the pressure would, would, would perhaps increase. Uh, how did you deal with that as a person and as a swimmer? When we look at the London Paralympic Games, um, and this, there's one aspect I'll touch on which actually makes things still the nerves and also make it all feel relatively feel like you're back in Australia. And so there's a legendary um, uh, announcer that has um, that is lives in South Australia, but has gone and commentated at um, a number of Olympic Games for the Australian as the Australians, but also for the English broadcasting rights for uh, the Paralympics as well. And to be announced in the stadium by the same announcer that we have at nationals, because he regularly does nationals for swimming as well, made the the London Stadium feel like it was just nationals, to feel like it was just states and to feel like it was just at home and to bring the nerves down because it, that felt relatively the same. And so in terms of that aspect, that's probably really helped calm the nerves and as, a, as an opportunity to be able to set in to the, um, to the Paralympics in your first race, that there wasn't anything better than that. Fantastic, fantastic. I'm going to go to some submitted questions that we have um, from Alexander Kalender. Now, he's from Sunbury College. So thank you, Alexander, for your input for today's show. And we've just spoken about 2012, 2016, 2018, and here we are in 2020 in a really interesting world. Um, and his first question to you, Matt, really touches on that. With COVID-19 suspending the Paralympic and the Olympic trials until next year, how, do, how does your goals and mindset change for the upcoming season? I think that's a very interesting question. I haven't actually been asked this one. I haven't probably had a lot of chance to think about it, but it actually gets an opportunity to think about this out loud a little bit more now. And I look at the um, the opportunities that are being afforded to me in, in, in swimming and also in sport. Um, there are a number of athletes that are uh, will think that COVID-19 will extend their career and a number of athletes that feel like they cannot go any longer. And so I'm sort of sitting in the middle here and, and, and I'm one of the very lucky few athletes to be able to be back in the water still now. And so I will go on to trials next year and swim the trials there. And um, I'll try, be attempting to put my name forward for, for the Tokyo Games. But, uh, you know, there is a number of things that um, are in my life as well that are really important. And, and that includes work. And um, that for me uh, is having that balance as well. So uh, my goals have shifted in the way that it's only been pushed a year further forward. And now looking forward to, to racing whenever that returns, possibly at the start of next year. Thank you. Uh, Alexander has also got one final question for you. 
Um, and then we're going to move to a, a guest who's just joined us. But Alexander's final question was, is it easy to get sponsors and funding whilst focusing the majority of your time on training? Really mm -hmm. interesting question, Alexander. Yeah, so um, for those that are uh, elite athletes, women within swimming in Australia, there is um, you know a, a funding block that get, that gets provided by uh, Gina Reinhardt, Hart, who she is a big supporter of swimming and has been a supporting of Western Australian swimming, but also uh, the national body swimming in Australia for the last five years. And she set up a, a fund to really support swimmers to be the best they possibly could be. Um, and so there are some funding mechanisms through, um, through you know, Gina Reinhardt and also the government um, to be able to pay us a sort of wage and be able to focus on um, our recovery and, 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 and sleep and, and also performance. Um, however, that's, we still need to maintain a very high level of performance to achieve, to achieve that funding. In terms of sponsorship though, um, Paralympics is growing from uh, growing uh, exponentially in a very similar way to women's sport and so more uh, lucrative sponsorship deals are coming to the ways of, of parent sport um, and the first part of that was probably in London when a number of the great British or UK athletes uh, were sponsored by Adidas to the tune of 4.5 million pounds so it was a very lucrative deals out there but it is very far and few between still in women's sport and also in Paralympics. Thanks, Matt. And um, <coughs> for Xander Galenda from Sunbury College, I hope that's answered your questions and we appreciate you having an input to the Ask SSV show. I'm going to take you away from the floor now and I'm going to pass straight over to, I've got Callum from Bentley West Primary School. Welcome, Callum. Hi. How, How are you, you Callum? How are you going, Callum? Good. How are you? I'm very well, thanks, mate. What was your question today? Um, my question is, what is one tip that your swimming coach has given you that has helped you the most? I think that's an amazing question. Um, I've had a number of coaches in my, in my time, and um, from when I was your age right through to today. But I think one of the the most amazing uh, uh, points I'd like to say is, and it's the quote that my, uh, both my gym coach and my swim coach say today is trust the process. Trusting um, that the training that you've done, the work that you've done um, will achieve a great result. And I think that's probably one of the most um, greatest um, quotes that I can give from my coach, but also my coach today also supports my view in that balance is also important. Balancing your lifestyle, style, making sure that you've got sport, some school and a workplace to be able to have a nice, um, good part of your life as well and to enjoy time with your friends. Okay, thank you. No problems, Callum. Callum, what's your, what's your favourite swimming stroke, mate? Um, probably butterfly, butterfly or freestyle. <laughs> that, oh, but, yeah. Butterfly um, is probably one of the toughest strokes out there, and um, I I envy that you uh, that is probably one of the, your favourites. Um, I actually swim my butterfly with one arm and one leg, and I breathe to the side, and so that is something that um, is something that I really. It's different, but I've raced people as well, and sometimes I can be faster than people with two arms as well. So, um, but it's a great challenge to butterfly, and I hope you do very well with it. Yeah. Callum, Callum, can I say there's probably not many young athletes or swimmers like you to put your hand up to put butterfly first. So, big, big high five to you, mate. Um, have you come to an SSB state championship before? Um. No. Or a region or division SSV event before? Um, yes. Which region are you part of, Callum? Oh, you'd be the Southern Metro, wouldn't you? Uh, yeah. Fantastic. Well, I'm sure we're going to see your face around. Callum, I've got one last question for you, mate. So what is your goals in, in, in swimming? Where would you like to go? 
Um, probably to one of more proper, um, like high swimming or like Olympics and that. Oh, that's awesome, mate. I'd love to go there, but it's unlikely, but I want to. Uh, another quote I've always seen is, you know, you know, aim for the stars, you might land on the moon. So it's, uh, it's something you'll always achieve. You know, you put your mind to it, you can always get there. Thanks. Say, Callum. Thank you very much for joining us, Callum. And uh, as I said before, to our previous guest, we wish you the best for the next six months of swimming and beyond. We look forward to seeing you in SSV events soon. Thank you, Callum. It's interesting, my next question to you Matt, was going to be, what would you say to a teenager who would like to represent their country one day? And I really like that quote that you just said. So um, thank you, thank you very much. I think, there's um, so, yeah, I think there's so many quotes out there that are relevant and it's just, you know, you know, setting your mind to the all of these things and, and you can, if you miss by only a, a millimetre, you're going to be in, in, a, in a place which is still successful as well. Sure thing. I've got a, another submitted question via YouTube um, from Emerson Neal from Maribyrnong College. Really interesting one. We're going to change tax a little bit. So thank you, Emerson, for submitting this one. The difficulty and challenges of being a Paralympic swimmer. Do you want to elaborate on that a bit, Matt? Poor. Oh, that can be taken a lot of different ways. Um, but I would say one of the things that it, the challenge is, is as well is managing your um, fatigue levels. Um, it is well reported as well and also for our sports science department that our fatigue levels are significantly um, uh, 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 far more significant than an able-bodied person. So I guess that would be the main um, thing that, that all our coaches and teachers and um, in fact a lot of teachers will say this is, is a lot of children with disability will uh, fade throughout the day a lot faster than their able-bodied peers and that's the same thing in sport. So I think with Paralympics, our fatigue, managing our fatigue is something that we need to always be wary of. And with fatigue, Matt, I mean, swimmers famously, early mornings, late afternoons after school, and I mean, does that play a part in it? A little bit. Um, so the, the, the thought process behind, and I don't, know, don't know if many people really know this, is that um, the thought process between morning and afternoon sessions, and particularly early mornings, um, is to mirror the heats and finals um, of, of our competitions, but also to get in the amount of aerobic effort that is required for particularly younger ages um, to get uh, the aerobic effort in for the younger kids and before school and before the public in terms of numbers in, in, in because there was a lot of public swimmers that come in during that period of time as well. So um, it's you know, the amount of aerobic time, it's the same with gymnasts. We need to be in and doing as much effort as we can um, to be doing morning and afternoons. That's really interesting insight, that, into heats and finals, having been morning and night. So if you're a swimmer out there at the moment who, you know, has dragged, you, dragged yourself out of bed for a morning session, then you need to find yourself back there at 4pm. Well, that's, uh, that's one way to look at it. Um, <clears throat> Matt, you've, you've been part of the swimming scene now for quite some time. Um, as I mentioned before, almost coming up on a decade now since you came into the scene in, in Rio and time goes quickly. You've had to stay in form and, and fit and firing for, for many, many years. Uh, what sacrifices have you made to get to get to where you've got to at the moment? I, I think there's probably two or three really main things and it's very similar for a lot of high performance athletes. I think the first one is a sacrifice in your social life. Um, and that's something that um, I made, you know, was a particular big thing for me right through my teenagers. You know, I was invited to 16th, to 18th, to 21st even. And it's very hard to, to be able to get, keep a social life, but also reach for those performances because my excuse, my, not excuse, my reason for not attending social events would always be, oh, I've got training in the morning or I've got training this afternoon. Sorry, I can't come. So that's one sacrifice that I've had to sort of, um, you know, 
to, to live with for most of my career. Um, another one I'll put out there as well is um, my schooling, which I think we can sort of come back to as a, as a bigger piece later on, that um, my year 12 was split into three years. So I actually didn't finish my year 12 until I was 19 and a half. So um, the benefit to that is I was able to get an extra team pick out of that. Um, but there are a number of um, sacrifices um, that come with that and it all relates to the amount of commitment and time that is required in swimming. Thank you, Matt. Um, you do mention the fact that, uh, you know, you split your VCE over a, a period of time and I, I imagine some of our older athletes on the SSV family can relate to juggling schoolwork and, and, their, and their life in the pool. Or, yep. or any sport for that matter. Um, explain to us how, how that was and, and how you felt juggling that and, and what it was like going back to school after yep. your official year 12, it would have been. So year 12, my th what would be my normal year 12 year was also in 2012. So it made sense to do what is called an atypical VCE. And so, uh, which is a series of English maths and a, a number of um a number of uh one two three four units um however um i don't get an atar out of that so i do have my year 12 certificate with a pass however to get into university i need to write a direct entry letter explain my situation as, as an elite athlete and essentially roll a dice with the university on that front but there were a number of times where i was um you know, in, in my year 13, as you say, um, and um, your, you, you, all your peers from year 12, which is the same age with you, have now moved on into other things with university. So there's a little bit of envy going on there, um, but also it's, it, it's putting all that into perspective that you're doing this because you're really athlete status and you're doing what's right for you. Um, but none of this would have been support, uh, would have been able to happen unless it was for the support of the staff at Melbourne College and Croydon Secondary College at the time. So, um, you know, I've, I did a video with my old uh, principal, um, Terry Bennett, who's now the director of the Eastern Region. Um, and I really um, want to thank him for all the support and time he put into that um, to make sure that I was be able to, would able to be succeed in both in the pool but also at school. Okay, <clears throat> so we're going to switch to uh, a live guest on the show this afternoon. So Welcome to Gabriella Tartha from Westbourne Grammar. Gabriella, welcome to Ask SSP with Matt Harnipal. What made you want to become an Olympian? Sorry, it broke up a bit, Gabriella. Do you want to try that again? Sorry. What made you want to become an Olympian? I think for me, um, I watched for the first time the Olympics in Sydney. I was six years old. And watching the success of the Olympic team in the Sydney home games. But it wasn't until I started seeing the performance of the Paralympians at the Athens Paralympics, and I'll be, I was sitting on the couch and watching the TV on a what was, it was broadcasted by the ABC at the time, and I was like, no, I want, I want to do this. I want, to, I want to do swimming as one of my sports. Um, I've done many sports in my time. I've done table, cricket, you know, AFL. I've done a lot of different things, but um, swimming was what I wanted to do, and um, I, I just saw it, just took to it. It was an amazing, um, I took. I just took to water and I really enjoyed being around the pool and also the, the friends you make in that environment.
Did your family support you in your decision in becoming an Olympian? I think that of all the questions that we've had here, Pisa and, and Gabriella, I think this is probably the one of the most important questions of them all. To be an elite athlete, you need to have the support of your parents, period. To be able to go and travel across the country, to be able to be um, taken to training at a young age um, and to be, you know, to have everything ready for when you um, are going to an early morning session to prepare the things for the to competition from the weekends. Um, the list goes on and on and on. But it really is a, is a, a huge, um, almost a caveat in being able to be an elite athlete is to have the support of your parents. Um, and again, I really, they have a, a lot to be thanked for for what they've done in my career. How old were you when you first figured out you wanted to become an Olympian? Um, as I said, Gabrielle, I was, I was probably six years old when I first saw the Sydney Olympic Games. Um, and from then it was, you know, the rest is history. And I really, uh, you know, I enjoyed being in part, part of the water. Um, and, you know, I went through learn to swim as every child does as well. So. I had an understanding of what what the water was all about and the feel of the water and how it was for my body and for my, I guess, my disability as well. And I find that was the, the sport for me, I guess. that's. Um, and I think that was when I was six years old in Sydney, I think, to, to wrap it up. What were your strengths and weaknesses during training and competitions? Um, my coach says this quite frequently to me all the time, that I'm a very, very good competitor, but not a very good trainer. And um, in terms of my strengths and weaknesses, I'm not a very good trainer, but I can, I, I can pull a very good race together. So, um, so that's something I've had to learn over a long period of time. How do I improve my training attitude? How do I improve the way I can back up, uh, back up, from train to train to train to make sure that I'm the best that I can be. And so, um, but in terms of strengths and weaknesses, um, I'd say my training is sometimes a weakness and my competitive strength is that's where I can always pull it together on, um, on the field of play. What were your other career choices before becoming an Olympian? Um, Gabriel, I don't think I really had a, uh, another career choice in mind. I think that I always wanted to be an Olympian or a Paralympian for that matter. I just think for me, I always wanted to go into sports management after my career was finished. I think when I was in year nine, I had pretty much had my heart set on working within, in sport as a manager, which is something I do now as my job outside of the pool. I work uh, in trying to support people with disability and people with from cultural and uh, cultural backgrounds to get access to physical activity in a recreation centre. So I really enjoy that role, and I think that that's something where I was always going to end in, end up in um, after swimming. Thank you for answering my questions. Gabriella, thank you so much for being part of the show and asking some really interesting and informative questions. And I'm sure not only you, but everyone has got a lot of, out, a lot of Matt's answers for that. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. Okay, from Gabriella to... Gabriella to Kayla, I have. I've got Kayla Rose Wilson from Merbu North Secondary College now. We may not be able to get Kayla on video, but we are possibly going to be able to get it on audio. So, Kayla, have we got? So, um, just to wrap to wrap up my my comments, there was just talking about there was a slogan that was done for for the London Paralympic Games. Um, so, and it was done by uh, an organisation there, and they said um, in referring to the Olympics, they were saying thanks for the warm up, guys. 
we'll see you in two weeks because there's a two week gap in between the Olympics and the Paralympics. And so that's, um, I think that was probably explained how um, they just thought the Olympics was the warm up. The real show was the Paralympics in a couple of weeks. So that was something really amazing. Uh, we're just going to finish off with a few, if you can give us some, some really quick answers on these ones. Yeah, sure. Um, so we'll just buy really quick ones to finish up on our broadcast today. Um, what do you think was the most important physical training you did to prepare for the Olympics? I think doing about eight sessions a week. Um, so eight sessions, two, two hours worth. So And then also another three um, gym sessions on top of that. So it's, it's it becomes almost a, a part-time job it, um, on top of the, the physical uh, recovery that comes with it. Sure thing. And one last question from us. Your nickname is Pineapple. Can you explain that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so Pineapple just has a very... Um, uh, I guess relevance to my last name. Um, my in Dutch uh, translated Harnapel actually means rooster apple, um, and so the um, so it's just it's it was given to me in high school and it's stuck ever since. There you go. There you have it, guys. You heard it first from Matt Harnapel, um, <laughs> the pineapple of the pool. So look, we're going to wrap up. Um, look, thank you so, so much to all of you who have joined in today. We do apologise for some of the issues that we've experienced later towards the show. But first and foremost, Matt, thank you so much for your time and sharing your journey with us and with the SSV family. No problems, Peter. Thanks for having me. We look forward to seeing all of you next week. We've got Kelly Hetherington, track and field superstar, joining us at next week's Ask SSV show. We'll see you next Friday. Uh -huh.